Scale Nation, I get people asking me all the time, how do I read so much as busy as I am? And the secret is, a lot of my reading people do for me. That's right, I use Audible. Audible is a service that will read books to you and allow you to get the content while you're driving from account to account. I've been using Audible for years and you can try it for free, one book and one month for free on me through our affiliate link, scalinguph2o.com forward slash Audible. Welcome to Scaling Up H2O, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. My name is Trace Blackmore. I get to host Scaling Up H2O. What an honor. Thank you, all of you listeners out there that I affectionately call the Scaling Up Nation. Today is a fun show. It's a fun show for me because I get to introduce to you, the Scaling Up Nation, some of the people that I've got to meet throughout my water treatment career. And as I hope you know and you've experienced, it's not about what you know, it's about what people care to teach you. And I have just learned, I've learned a lot on my own, but the fun part has been when people actually teach me something or when I get into a dialogue with something that I think I know and then I learn it even better or something else around it because I had that conversation with that person. And being a member of an association has really helped me meet other people that do the same thing that I do. Also, being a member of a mastermind, I can't tell you how much that has helped me. I've been a member of a mastermind group for well over 10 years, and this was a group where we all knew business. We might not have all known water treatment, but we all knew business. And when I had an issue, I brought that issue to the group and that group just started to go to work from there. They started asking questions. They started with how do I understand the issue the way Trace understands the issue. And by doing that, I saw things in a totally different perspective, and I started getting ideas about what I could do to solve this issue. Now, mind you, they have not given me any advice up to this point. It's just in their questions. So their questions are helping me, and the questions are helping them ultimately give me better advice. So then we got to the advice portion, and that's when they said, if I had this issue, this is what I would do. Nation, there has just been so many pivotal decisions that I've made in my personal and professional life that I've talked over with my mastermind group that I don't think I would have made as good a decisions had I not had counsel with these issues. And that's the whole deal. Life is short. Life is hard. And life is so much more fun when you can do it with other people. And that's what the mastermind group is. It's where people are coming together to learn more about each other. But the simple purpose is how do we help each other get further, faster in life? And I have well over 10 years within a mastermind group that I've been a member of where I am seeing the benefit of. And I am now pleased to let you know, and hopefully you already know this, that we have a mastermind group that potentially you can join. It's called the Rising Tide Mastermind, and it is a group of people that get together on a regular basis to do exactly what I described. Now, the group is not for everybody, and everybody doesn't qualify for the group, just depending on the all the things that you've got going on in your life. Are you able to commit to the group? Are you able to freely share? Are you able to give information when it is required of you? And most important, do you keep everything we talk about confidential? 
So if you're looking for a group and this sounds like the best thing for you, I urge you to reach out to me to see if this is the right group for you. And we will interview each other to make sure that that is the case. But listen, I am here to tell you that whether or not this group is right for you, you need to be involved with something like this. If you are going to bed each and every night thinking about how you are going to solve issues that you have in your life, you don't have the right people in your life to pour into you and help you with those decisions. You know what you know, and that's never going to change. When you pour yourself into a community of people and you let them know what you need help with, you now have a huge force coming together as a collective group and individually all around solving your problem. And just imagine somebody else in the group most likely had a similar issue and they've already figured out how to solve it. So they're not going to tell you what to start to do. They're also going to tell you what not to do. And when you start, you'll most likely start at step five instead of step one. Folks, there are so many amazing stories that have come from the mastermind. And again, you've got to figure this out for yourself. If this group's not right for you, you need to find the group that is right for you. Trust me, well over 10 years experience, I would not be where I am today had it not been for me being involved in another group. Well, Nation, as I started saying, the group is all about community, and community is just getting out there and meeting other people. I had the great fortune many years ago at one of the first AWT functions that I ever attended as a business owner. I met a gentleman that I cannot wait to introduce you to. Here's that interview. My lab partner today is Charlie Heineman of Precision Water Technologies. Charlie, how are you? I'm doing great, Trace. How are you today? I'm so excited to have you on the Scaling Up H2O podcast. You and I have known each other for a long time, and I finally got you on the show. Well, that's great. Uh, yeah, I think we first met in the CWT uh, when we took our CWT back in Atlanta. That was right. When was it? About 2002? I, I think that's right. It was right around then. You and I took the exam together. That was back when you had to take it in a proctored center. of uh, AWT was the only place you could take it. You took it after, I think, either a convention or a training seminar. Right. We took it after the training seminar. And if I recall, that was uh, the rules back then. What You could not leave the room for any reason. You couldn't even go to the bathroom. Right. Well, Charlie, that's been a long time ago. What uh, I'm going to ask you, what have you been up to? Not only since then, but well, you're going to tell us your entire career all in this episode. But before we get there, who is Charlie Heineman? Who is Trace Blackmore interviewing today? Okay, Charlie Heineman uh, was born in St. Louis. Uh, my family owned a grocery store at the time in St. Louis, in which I worked part-time. I have two siblings. I have an older brother and a twin sister. And uh, unfortunately, my sister got all the brains in the family because she went on to be an electrical engineer. Uh, my brother and I both uh, ran track and cross country. And we were, were very fortunate. We both ended up with uh, college scholarships. So we all took off and we kind of split apart after high school and got to see each other at Christmas and other times, but uh, kind of separated our family at that point. I went to Southwest Missouri and uh, ran track for a little bit, but then uh, it wasn't as much fun as when I was in high school. So after two years of college, and this is 1968, I got the great idea to drop out of school and join the Marine Corps. So in 1968, at the height of the Vietnam War, not the smartest move I ever made in my life, I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, I served in Vietnam, 69 to 70. I got back from Vietnam. They gave me an early out of the Marine Corps because they didn't need me. Being infiltrated didn't need me anymore. So I went back to college. And it was really probably the best thing I ever did is drop out, go in the Marine Corps, because I really grew up during those two years. 
I actually started college when I was 17. And so when I went to the Marine Corps, I was 19, and I got out when I was 21. And then the next three years, I went back to college, and my grades improved a lot. I knew what I was doing, and I, I was focused on uh, getting an education that time and getting out into the work world. Uh, my degree is actually, I'm a teacher. Never did teach that much student teaching, but I'm a teacher. My major was biology, and I have a chemistry and math minor. At one time, I wanted to become a veterinarian, but by the time I got out of the Marine Corps, I felt it's time for me to go to work and get, you know, I was almost 24, 25 years old. It was time to go to work. And I uh, had one job after I got out of college for two years. I was in sales for a laboratory reagent company. And then uh, after two years in 1975, I decided that it's time to make a change and do something different. Yeah. So with all of that, you wanted to be a veterinarian. How do you go from wanting to be a veterinarian to water treatment? Well, because veterinarian, by the time I would have got out, I would have been 30 years old. And I decided I didn't want to spend that much more time in college. And uh, most of my friends, because I did go into the military, were already out out of college and working and uh, making some money. And I was still going to college, so I said, I'm not going to be doing this for another five years. So dropped out of that, decided to be, didn't know what I wanted to be at that time, so I got a teaching degree. And uh, like I said, I had a biology, chemistry background, so uh, I did so laboratory reagents for a while. And then in 1975, I uh, got into water treatment by accident. By accident? You're going to tell us about that. I went to a, uh, didn't know what I wanted to do, so I went to a headhunter. And the headhunter said, I got a job opportunity for looking for somebody with your degree and uh, your background. He told me about Nalco Chemical Company. I had no idea anything. This is before the internet, of course. Gave me a little pamphlet on what Nalco did. Didn't pay much attention, but I went up to, uh, at that point, Nalco was located in Oak Brook, and I accepted a job. Uh, I guess this was September. I started working for them in October 1975 and uh, continued working for Nalco for the next 23 years. 23 years. And then great career. And I assume something happened. You decided, hey, maybe I can do this on my own. Well, and actually what a couple things happened is, uh, one, they offered me early retirement and I was 50 years old. At the time, so I took the early retirement, and but before I even retired, they offered me another job as a subcontractor working for Nalco. So I retired one month and was back working for them the following month. So as a in a division called Nalco Diversified Technologies, and uh, basically, I was given all the accounts that Nalco did not want. The smaller accounts, anything under $7,500 as a subcontractor to go out and take care of them and run service. So I did that for the next couple of years. Unfortunately, uh, the Nalco I knew changed a lot over that time. And uh, uh, for all those who've been water treatment for a while, Suez bought Nalco in 1999 and in uh, 2001 decided to get rid of our, our division. And lo and behold, October 2001, I was without a job. They folded our division. So I had been looking ever since Suez bought uh, bought Nalco to do something on my own. And so I was lost my job October 31st, opened up Precision Water November 7th. So it was 20 years ago last Sunday. I started Precision Water. How about that? And at first I uh, wasn't sure what I was going to do. And actually somebody you all know inadvertently got made my mind up to get into water treatment business myself is you all know Steve Dummler with ChemCal. Absolutely. Many people know him. I almost went to work for Steve and uh, he offered me a job. I went out and I saw his beautiful house and uh, the, the nice facility he had and everything else and decided at that point, why can't I do this for myself? Yeah. And for the listeners out there that do not know Steve Dummler, he was the owner of ChemCal. Yep. And quite a successful company. And uh, anyway, uh, I, at that point, decided to go out for myself. And uh, who is now my counterpart, my uh, partner in, in Precision Water Technologies, John Luiso, 
they actually said, they said, why would you want to work for somebody else? Take the chance on your own. And if it doesn't work, you'll have another job in six months anyway. So fortunately, it did work out. It seems like that turned out to be good advice. It turned out to be real good advice, probably the best advice I ever uh, ever had because uh, I had a lot of accounts and no competitive pressure because there were accounts that Nalco really didn't want. And the uh, other thing is when they folded our division, I did not have a non-compete with Nalco. So I was free to go out and get those accounts. Well, you know, like anybody, you go out and do a good job for your customers, they're going to hire you back. Now, I believe we were side by side when we took the CWT exam. And don't worry, there was like, I think, 10 or 12 feet apart from us. So there was no looking on one side or the other. And I don't remember who finished before the other one, but we both found out that we passed. And that wasn't like today. That wasn't just hitting the OK button on a computer and then seeing congratulations. I think we had to wait three months. I think so. We had to wait some time for the test results to get back. Today, they come back the same morning. Now, three months after you took that examination, that was in Atlanta, you went back home. Three months, I think we got a letter at the time. I don't think we got a phone call. You opened that letter up. What did you do? I saw that I passed, and then um, I said, boy, I've passed the test. That's the hardest part, but now I've got to do the rest of the work. And uh, there was quite a bit more than that than I uh, had realized to get the uh, references and get, you know get everybody in to uh, give you a good reference and uh, to move on with it and, and get the rest of the program. So I guess uh, within six months I had my CWT and I was quite proud of it. And uh, I think it gives you prestige. It shows that you see a CWT, you know that they know water treatment. I would say most companies today, most people could not pass the CWT. And I'm on the CWT committee, so I know more people fail than pass the first time around. So, Charlie, what would you say the CWT has opened up for you? I think it just lets customers know that uh, I know the business, and we, we publicize it. We use the brochures for CWT, tell customers about it, what the test is and everything else. So I think most of the time they just... Our customers, or we talk to people, they are impressed and they know right up front we know what we're talking about. And so it's opened up a lot of avenues. And I, uh, working with most of the people that work for me to get to CWT, and I really promote it within our company. Have you seen CWT as a requirement in some of the bid specifications that you've been working with? We haven't seen that much in Texas, but I hope that changes. For somebody that is studying for the Certified Water Technologist designation right now, what advice would you give them? That you have to study all five parts of the exam. You know, you might be better in, you know, cooling water or boiling water, but you uh, better know the other aspects of the exam. There's five parts to it, and you have to be uh, well trained in all areas. How have you been able to keep up all your certification for that? Because you've had the CWT as long as I've had. So I'm thinking I've renewed at least three or four times. I think it's been three times. And uh, for me, it's been very easy, especially lately, because I go to the convention every year. It gives me my five points each year. But then I'm also on several committees. I'm on the CWT committee, and I'm also on the Business Resources Committee. I think those are two of my favorite uh, committees. I used to be on the education committee, but found out I didn't have time once I joined the business resources committee. Because I'm so involved, I don't even look at my points because usually I get my points within the first two years of uh, continuing education credits to uh, maintain my CWT. I do work with other people in our company and and have to push them a little bit because they don't go to the convention every year. And uh, Make sure they watch webinars and uh, you know take part of the, the AWT and the things AWT offers them. Yeah, that will really get away from you. So folks out there, if you have your CWT and you're not keeping track of all the continuing education that you need, do not wait until you get a letter stating that your application for renewal is due because you will not get it all done within that short window. 
it makes it really tough when you have to watch 15 webinars in a couple weeks period and everything else. But if you stay up with them, and, then, and actually a lot of the webinars, you get points for them, and they're very good. You, you learn a lot from them. So uh, I think it's best to have you new if you're not going to the CW, you know, to the convention every year, or if you're not going to training or something else, the webinars are probably a very good aspect to keep up with your CWT. And a pro tip that maybe some of the listeners don't know out there is all those webinars are free. So you can get all of your continuing education for free if you keep up with it in time. Right. In addition to that, you don't have to watch the webinar when it's scheduled. You can go back and look at the uh, webinar a couple weeks later and you still get the points for it. And and, uh, it's automatically put on your uh, CWT for your renewal. So with the CWT, what I really like is that they show you the points. All you have to do is look at where you are on the AWT website and it'll tell you how many points you have going to your uh, recertification. And Charlie, very much like myself, you've been involved with the Association of Water Technologies. I have tremendous people in my life today that have just helped me with so many things because I did involve myself in AWT and I got to meet them and I got to know them at a very stronger level. And they saw me giving to the organization and they not only gave to the organization, but then we also give to each other. I know you've had experiences like that. How did you get started being involved with the AWT? We joined shortly after I opened the company. The year after we opened our company, I found out about AWT and we joined. And uh, I guess one of my first associations was with Jim James Malloy when he owned uh, Nashchem. And we started out by buying chemicals. And he, I think he might have been president at that time, but he, uh, he talked about AWT. Mm-hmm. I got involved in the organization. Uh, they also had a training in the Dallas area shortly thereafter. So I went to the training and got to see what was going on, got to know the people. And from there, I, you know, I took the CWT and I, got, I just got more involved. And early on, my partner and I used to alternate years that we went to the convention. But then I got to know so many people and I got so involved. Like I said, I was on the education committee. Currently, I'm on the C, uh, CWT and the business resources committee. So I say so, so involved. It's just networking. I I enjoy it. When I go to the convention, I see, I probably know half the people at the convention. And uh, I know all the people that were on the education committee, uh, uh, you know, Bruce, uh, Colin, and some of the others that have been teaching for a long time, got to know them. Uh, Just going to the committee meetings, you get to know people. And uh, I've learned seen a lot more people with the CWT committee uh, that I get to know. We become friends. We talk all the time in the same way. The more involved you are, the more you're going to get out of AWT. I uh, really don't understand why people join AWT and don't go to the convention or don't go to things. You know, it's almost like joining BOMA or something like that, not participating and not going to the meetings. You're paying for something you're not getting anything out of. So the more you put into AWT, The more you network, the more you're going to get out of it. I think that's very well said. You mentioned the the CWT committee, and I think we've had some people on where we've talked about that before. But you also mentioned the the business resource committee. And this past year, the Rising Tide Mastermind has partnered with the business resource committee. So some of the material that we were doing with some speakers, we brought over to that committee. But I bet there's a bunch of listeners out there that just don't know what you do within that committee. So what exactly is it? The committee is uh, it started out looking at webinars, I think. And, uh, uh, but the last three years, we have uh, do most of the work for setting up the business owners meeting. And that was taking place in the uh, spring. We moved it this past year to the convention because... Uh, because of COVID-19. And uh, in that committee, we look at speakers that can come in and, and talk about our type of business and how to be successful in water treating. We also have round tables at the, at the uh, business resources meeting where people get to talk to themselves, get to be friends with other business owners. And uh, it's pretty much networking and getting to know other people and other ideas. We, we learn about you know, hiring people, how to, uh, you know, 
who the attorneys are, what the do's and don'ts as a business owner, uh, which sometimes you learn by the School of Hard Knacks. This is a way of going in there and talking about people and seeing what other people, what mistakes they've made. And they'll tell you about it is so you don't repeat the same mistakes someone else has made. We also have uh, do most of the webinars. And I know we, we've done some work with your company and, and doing some of the uh, podcasts and so forth. And uh, I think it's just all around brings people together and the business owners. It gives them a chance to get to meet each other and uh, explore new ideas. Uh, I think lately, one of the big things is the, uh, the availability of products out there. Uh, and everybody's uh, finding that a challenge of getting the chemistries. Uh, I think you know 90% of the phosphorus made in China is not being made right now. So we're having to look at you know, other resources of uh, how do we make chemical and how do we stay in business. No doubt about it. You and I are definitely sold on the Association of Water Technologies. Uh, Nation, if you want to find out more about that, it's awt.org. But I'm going to shift gears just a little bit on you, Charlie, and ask you a couple questions about your career. So what would you say your biggest accomplishment has been when it comes to water treatment? Starting my own company, without a doubt. I worked for other companies for many, many years. and. Uh, it was scary to start your own company. You, uh, you're out there and you don't know anything. You have to learn. And when you start off a company, you have to be everything. You're delivering the chemical. You're selling the chemical. You're finding test kits. You're finding suppliers. So very difficult, but the rewards are enormous after you uh, open your own company. Uh, uh, we were very fortunate started a company and within six months we had about 75 small customers but it was bread and butter and got us started off and that allowed us to get bigger customers down the road charlie let me ask when we get into business we don't know all the things that we don't know and looking back over 20 years you learned a whole heck of a lot if you knew all that stuff all the stuff you were really getting into as a business owner would you have started your own firm I would do it, but I do a lot smarter today than uh, what I did 20 years ago. Uh, School of Hard Knocks 20 years ago today, I feel like it'd be a lot easier to get into because, mm-hmm. I, you know, I know how to get to suppliers. I know how to, you know, one of the things, as you know, Trace, you start out in business, the banks don't run up and give you money. They, they you know, it's very difficult to borrow. You know, I was very fortunate in that I had, Worked many years before and set myself up fairly well, so I didn't have to worry about failure uh, like some people do. But so it'd be a lot easier today, but what was scary back then and, uh, <laughs> and, and a lot of work. Uh, you put in a lot of 16 hour days. Charlie, have you had a mentor throughout your career? My main mentor was the first person I worked for in water treatment, district manager, and his name was Tom Evans. And had it happened for time, I might not have stayed in water treatment. He, uh, he was just a, a, a gem of a boss. He cared about his people. And if there's one thing I learned from Tom Evans, part of your job, you have to get out there and uh, sell chemical, but you take care of your people. And I think that's the reason our company has been successful is that we have very little turnover. I hear these people talking about turnover and hiring people and stuff like that. Our biggest problem is, trying to hire the right people and bring them on board. But since we've been in business, we've lost very few people. Most of the people stay with our company. And it's because I think my main goal is to take care of my our people working for us and not to pay them well and make sure that they're happy with what they're doing. Charlie, I know one of the reasons you're so successful is you consider yourself a mentor to others I think so many people put such a grandiose title on being a mentor. How do you look at that term or that role as being someone's mentor? My role as a mentor is to bring them along, make sure they're comfortable with what they're doing, that they understand what they're doing, that they like what they're doing. You know, so many people quit jobs because they do not like what they're doing. So we try to make it fun for them at Precision Water Technologies. Bring them along gradually at their own pace. Sometimes they don't even realize I'm probing them all the time and asking them questions. And uh, if they don't know the answer, we, we work on it. We find the answers. But uh, I figure everybody that I bring on, all of our young people, 
I'm kind of the mentor to them. And it's my job to bring them on and to uh, make sure advance their career in water treatment and to make sure that they're successful. Charlie, what is something, a fundamental task that every water treater needs to know how to do? Every water treater should know the chemistries involved in the uh, processes of water treatment. I think they need to learn the basics. Just like you go to school and you learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, you have to learn what's in the chemistries and how they work and how they function. I see too many people today that don't learn the basics, so they don't understand the chemistries, and it's very difficult for them to put together the right programs for the customer. So I think you have to look at the process the customer have, what he's looking at, heat loads, everything else, and then learn how it works with the chemistries themselves. If the automation goes out, they have to be able to uh, figure out how to make it right. No, I equate that I'm a scuba diver and we use dive computers and they're fantastic and they allow me to be so much safer and plan the dive so much easier and uh, more accurately, but it is electronic. And if it does go out, I also know how to run manual tables so I don't get myself hurt. So I I think those two go hand in hand. I I believe it does. Automation is great. Don't get me wrong. I love automation. but you have to know how to cross-check it to make sure it's working properly. You know, if the uh, perfect example, during the wintertime down here in Texas, some of the cooling towers are running very low load. Some of the phosphonates tend to break down. Uh, you can run a PTSA tracer and get to just perfect numbers in the tracer and end up with calcium phosphate buildup in the coolant tower. And people have to realize that sometimes the chemistries break down over time if the holding time index is too long. And how to check that, you know, how to run the the orthophosphate test to see if the phosphonates are breaking down. So there's little things that you have to be able to to have common sense and experience to go back and check to keep you out of trouble, especially in wintertime conditions. And when you, you don't have much load, you think everything's easy, but that's when you can get the most difficult and most trouble. That's an excellent point. Charlie, it's always difficult to find out what you don't know you don't know. When you find out you don't know something, what's your process to go learn it? I use my networking and the people I know, and and, and through AWT is probably my first resource, is I know some people, very good people, like we both know in AWT, to go to those people and ask questions. If you don't know something, let the customer know you don't know it but then research it and then come back with the customers. Customers really appreciate it. Charlie, very interesting. I think that's the most repeated piece of advice that people give on this podcast, that don't lie, don't tell people you know something or pretend you know something. If you don't, tell them you don't know it, but you'll find out and get back to them. But then also the biggest fear that most water treaters have is they're going to be asked a question that they don't know. So hopefully after today's episode, people start putting those things together that it's not that bad if you realize you don't know something. It can be bad if you don't handle it properly. Yes, it can. I think, you know, there's a, water treatment is changing so much over the last 20 years. You see the uh, new products coming out. It's, it's, it's just amazing with all the stuff that's coming out in the water treatment, the ProMOS, some of the other new programs, different things that were not heard of uh, 10, 15 years ago. So you have to stay up with the technology. You have to keep on looking at new and better things. A lot of times you don't know, but you know where the resources are to find out. And I think that's the biggest thing is learning where your resources are, learning who to go to if you don't know something. And, you know, AWT just has such a breadth of uh, people with knowledge and different uh, expertises that it's just Great to be able to go to yeah you know, to a lot of people and uh, get answers for questions. Well, you and I are definitely fans of that organization. Let me shift gears once again. I now have some lightning round questions for you. So, are you buckled in? Are you ready for these? I hope so. <laughs> All right, Charlie. So you can now go back in time and speak to your former self on your very first day as a water treater. What advice would you give? My first day as a water treater, I didn't know what a boiler was. 
I probably picked the brains of the uh, my district manager more and, uh, and the people around me and asking more questions. I think probably early on I was young and thought, you know, didn't want to ask questions, didn't want to let people know how, how little I did know. Charlie, what are the last few books that you've read? You really want to know. I really do. <laughs> okay. The last book I read was a book called Fortitude. It was by Dan Crenshaw. He's a representative down here in Congress for Texas. Just enjoyed reading his book and uh, learning about his background and, and what he went through becoming a Navy SEAL and then going on to Congress and uh, has done a heck of a good job for us down here in Texas. Well, Charlie, when Hollywood makes a movie about Charlie Heineman, who do you want playing Charlie? I think Tom Selleck. I, I, I uh, you know, watch his movies. I like him. He's probably one of my favorite actors, and uh, I would probably have him portray me as if I, uh, if it was going to be a movie made of myself. So. I think that's a great choice. My last question, if you had the ability to talk to anybody throughout history, who would it be with and why? It would be President Reagan. And uh, the reason is uh, my feelings about our country are very similar to what his feelings are. Well, Charlie, I want to thank you for coming on the Scaling Up H2O podcast. And I also want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, Trey. Appreciate that. I'm glad to be here. Scaling Up Nation, that was Charlie Heineman, one of the nicest people I have ever had the fortune of meeting. And if you are ever at an Association of Water Technologies conference, I promise you, you're going to find Charlie there. Seek him out. You will not regret it. And I mentioned the Association of Water Technologies conference of course, we've got those that come up, but then we also have so many other associations that can help us with whatever type of water treatment that we practice. So here are a couple events that are coming up. So the Water and Wastewater Equipment Treatment and Transport Show is coming to Indianapolis, Illinois on February 21st through 24th. So go to our show notes page at scalinguph2o.com. We'll have more information for you about that. And then the American Membrane Technology Association, along with the American Water Works Association, is having their Membrane Technology Conference and Exposition February 21st through 24th. That's going to be in Las Vegas, Nevada. So if you go there, make sure you go to the conference as well as all the other things that are in Las Vegas. Of course, all the information you want to know about that on our show notes page. And finally, mark your calendars for March 22nd. March 22nd is World Water Day. And there's just so much that we are able to do as industrial water treaters. The number one thing is that we have jobs because there is water. And World Water Day just allows us to focus on that, that water is the most amazing and most precious resource that we have on this planet. So we have one day, March 22nd, where we're really going to recognize that. And we're going to do something fun for that. So look forward to an upcoming episode of Scaling Up H2O, where we celebrate World Water Day. And of course, something else to celebrate is making sure that we are trying to stretch ourselves. How are we making sure that we are getting better each and every week to help us with this? Here is another installment of Thinking on Water with James. Here's James McDonald. Welcome to Thinking on Water with James the segment where we don't give you the answers, we give you the topics and questions for you to think about, drop by drop. Now let's get to it. In this week's episode, we're thinking about how long after an oxidizer feeds to a cooling tower should you wait to test the residual. Should you test immediately, wait 30 minutes, an hour, or several hours? How long does it take the oxidizing biocide to be effective? What's happening to the oxidizing biocide over time within the system? Is it fed at a time of day that makes it easy to test at the appropriate time afterwards? 
Should you manually initiate a feed so you can test afterwards or not? What do you write in your field service report if you miss the optimal testing window? Take this week to think about the optimal time for testing oxidizing biocides after they are fed. Be sure to follow hashtag TOW22 and hashtag ScalingUpH2O to share your thoughts on each week's thinking on water. I'm James McDonald, and I look forward to learning more from you. Nation, anything we mentioned on today's show, you can go to ScalingUpH2O.com, go straight to our show notes page, and you can find links for everything that we spoke about. You'll also find a link to leave me a voicemail so I know what the next show topic needs to be. So don't keep that information to yourself. Let me know what you want me to start talking about. And even if you have a guest you want me to interview, I would love to know who you know that I have not yet met so I can get them on this show and we can share whatever valuable information that they have with you, the Scaling Up Nation. Nation, have a safe week. I'll bring you another brand new episode next Friday. And until then, have a great week, folks. Like most people in the water treatment industry, there's always a struggle with work and life. And I had a daughter on the way and I was probably a little more mindful of how much I was working and how I can adjust my schedule or or make it in such a way that was sustainable for my family. And this conversation is a little more difficult when you don't have people in the water treatment industry because they don't understand the travel aspect, the service aspect, the technical uh, knowledge needed to be successful. It's a little more difficult to, to balance that. So to have a group of like-minded individuals to work through with the goal of self-development, it's really helpful to kind of hash through those problems for me. To find out more, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind.